Good morning. Today we're going to be looking at week five, or day five, Pastor Mike's Stepping Forward uh, book. If you haven't seen it, you got to check it out right there. W.M. Lingenfelter, A 39-Day Walk Through Ephesians. Uh, you should check it out. You get an older picture there with him even. Uh, if you haven't seen one, uh, you can get this on Amazon. You should totally check it out. Go through it with the church. This is a week-by-week devotional every Monday morning. Uh, if you did not know, my name is Pat Kay, and I am the sound guy right there. So, you're welcome. Uh, we're going to dive in, take a look at the insights, and put some challenges for this week. So, let's get to it. We're going to be in section two, what the Christian should know. And again, it's day five or week five, knowing hope and riches. And we're going to be Ephesians 1.18. The Apostle Paul is continuing his prayer for the saints in Ephesus. Excuse me, Ephesus. Uh, today, it's, it's just one verse, uh, but it's a good one. So let's go ahead and we're going to take a look. There we go. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And as we'll uh, look at at the second part of this, uh, we can kind of view this verse in two parts. The first part, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. And that's what we're going to uh, step right into. And if you remove the hope of his calling, you can put what right there on 118. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know, go to the next comma, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And those are the two things we're going to uh, talk about today. We're going to pull our main points from. So let's dive right in. And you'll see that I'm using this uh, new software we're able to use to record. So just get to show it off today and I really appreciate it. It's been amazing, amazing work working with this. So it's a lot of fun. Um, first half of the verse is the hope of his calling. Paul prays that the eyes of their hearts may be enlightened so that they will know what is the hope of his calling. Uh, as Pastor Mike points out in the book, uh, he clearly points out that there is a great freedom in the hope we have in the calling of our Holy Father. So we're going to have three parts here. The first part of this calling, we have a holy calling. This is not saying we are to act holy. Uh, God is the only one that can make us holy through the shed blood of Jesus. Uh, we will one day stand before him, holy and blameless because of the cross. And there's no good deeds uh, we could do. Nothing in this world that's going to get us to heaven that would make us holy and righteous before God when we stand before him. The shed blood of Jesus and the cross is the only way. Um, the next portion, now that we have this assured hope of one day standing before God, uh, holy and blameless, we understand that when God saves us, he calls us from darkness to light. So as Pastor puts it, uh, we're standing in the stunning and spectacular light of God. And you guys all know that uh, he is a light connoisseur and he is a good reference because he's always standing in some spectacular light. So the third piece here we're going to look at is as believers, we're all called to glory. Our hope is eternal glory. Uh, there's no wishing when it comes to God in eternity. As Grace said a couple weeks ago, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, our salvation is in Him. Therefore, our hope is in Him. It's not a hope in a sense of wanting something, uh, but it's something that is already ours. As believers, we look forward to receiving it one day. This is the hope that God desires us to know, not what we want and wish. 
between ourselves and the world, uh, we're very good at being distracted, at least I am. Uh, we often hope our good deeds are enough to find favor with God, but that's not how God works. Uh, he provides grace and mercy for us, but we don't build up a credit with God. Uh, we either are his adopted sons and daughters when we become saved, or we're not part of the family at all. Uh, there's no in-between, and hoping we are good enough to make it to heaven just isn't good enough. Uh, we must know God, and we must know his grace. And his grace is sufficient. No matter the deficit we think we are in, no matter the bad things we think we've done, uh, it, it's good enough. And God credits our account when we come to him with his righteousness and holiness. And it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, as you all know, uh, those of you that know him. So that's the first insight. And the second insight here is uh, the last part of verse 18. As I said, we're going to, so that you will know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So I hope you have your Bibles open and you're looking at this verse. It's the last portion of 18. We're going to look at it. It's pretty rich there. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? God wants the saints, or otherwise known as Christians uh, in Ephesus, to know the riches of God. In this particular passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is referring to the saints of God spread throughout the world. God's riches are his saints. Let me say that again. God's riches are his saints. God calls his creation to himself so he can consider himself rich. That is truly amazing uh, to consider. And just another piece of Ephesians that as we look through in this study and this devotion, uh, you just can't unpack enough, and we're not going to today, but it is truly amazing. Uh, so in Genesis chapter 2, we find that God made Adam from the dust of the earth, if you remember. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but if I pick up some dust and dirt and I blew in it and blew on it, I might make a mess, but that wouldn't be uh, worth a whole lot. Uh, and I know that there are a whole lot of people um, who don't feel like much these days. But as you know, all it took for God to create Adam was some dust and he made man. And we need to consider this. And the question is, when we, when we think about this and we think about things that hold value, um, are we valuable? You know, are you valuable? What do you think? What do you truly think? So the question is, who decides our value? Who gives us our worth? Does your family, your neighbor, your job, your society? Is it your race, your color, your religion? Is it where we're from? Can the president give me my worth? Can the media declare my worth? Can the quote-unquote experts of the world give me and describe to me and ascribe worth to my life? And we, we should all know the answer, and we do know the answer. The answer is God. And it's always been, and it's never going to change. So I just want to encourage you to consider that today. And I want you to know that the only thing, only, something is only valuable uh, when someone's willing to pay for it, right? You could sell something out of your barn. It might be the oldest thing in there. And if someone finds value in it, they'll give you money. And it's an amazing thing, and you don't care one lick about it. Um, <laughs> what about a, a piece of canvas with some paint splattered on it? It might have cost somebody, a, you know, maybe it's an expensive paint, $100. Uh, expensive canvas, maybe a couple hundred dollars. That thing could go for millions of dollars. And here we are, it might not mean anything to us, but someone's going to ascribe value to it. So, well, God, he said we were worth 
paying for. And do you know what he paid? He paid the cost of his son, Jesus. So for those of us who have kids, I want you to consider what would you pay for with one of your children or your oldest child? What would be worth that cost? I don't know about you, but I'm assuming uh, probably all say nothing. Nothing is worth that cost. So what would God be doing this for? Other than the fact that he ascribes value to us as his sons and daughters. Uh, he thought humanity was worth it. His creation was worth the price of his son. Us, me, you, your neighbor, the person down the road, the person, the people on the TVs, person sitting next to you at work, person in the car next to you. God died for all of us, and he gave his son for us. We're that valuable, each and every one of us. He thought it was worth that price. He sent his son to die on a cross so that he could have that relationship with us again like he had in the Garden of Eden. So today, in the middle of the madness, in this crazy world we're living in, uh, I want you to consider and find a way to use what we just said and how much God values you. Use that, apply that, think about that in your life this week. And also, if you can, share that with someone around you. We need, people need to hear the truth of who they are. Uh, God loves us so much. The world around us is crying out. People want to be deemed worthy. They want value. They want equality. They want to know that someone cares as much about them as they do themselves. And we know that God does. And that's the truth. So, ultimately, we need to look to the one who created us and died for us because we were so valuable to him. With that, I want to, I want to go over the last, uh, what we went over, two insights. There's two takeaways from today. First, don't forget your extreme value to God. You are of extreme value to God. So much so that his believers make him rich. He's collecting wealth by people coming to him. And it satisfies him. I, it's a, a mind-boggling. Uh, it's a mind-boggling verse. Because he's just collecting souls to himself so that he can have us in eternity. And that makes him rich. And that glorifies him. And that's what he's after. Um, the second takeaway, uh, any hope that we manufacture on our own will one day disappear. That hope we have in Jesus Christ, though, that lives for all eternity. When we come to the cross and Jesus becomes our Lord and Savior, we don't need to lean on the false hopes that make us feel good. That's, this is true eternal hope that never dies. So I leave you with this. Uh, do you rest in the hope? the true eternal hope that we talked about right now? Or do you wonder where you stand? Do you wonder if you wish or you want to make it to heaven? Did you do enough? Are you good enough? Have I done enough good deeds? Is my credit, is my account built up enough with God that I will make it? That's not the hope that we have in Christ. Those are not things that we should be standing on. We should be standing on the rock. We stand on God's truths in the word, in the Bible, that his grace is enough. So I want you to consider that today. Do you have this hope? If you're a born-again believer, you can thank God today for the hope of his calling. If you don't know him, no matter what your hope is and what you can conjure up and what you believe, uh, it's going to die with us. It's going to die with you. Um, so the bottom line is know Christ and have hope that is eternal. Because without Christ, all hope dies. 
So thank you for sharing with me. Uh, I hope you were encouraged and I hope we can all know his hope and riches and I encourage you all to get in this, get this study, to look at it, to get every week devotion and watch these. Uh, it's a really, really good, good devotion. Thank you so much and we'll see you soon.